till of tomorrow, representing over 80 countries. So to me, it feels as though I'm addressing the United Nations. If I can reach you with my presentation, then in some ways I have reached nearly half the world's population. And that's an incredible opportunity. So thank you so much. If the theme of this TEDx had been we at the universe, I as an astrophysicist or a cosmologist, you can be sure I would be happy to be sucked up by a talk on black holes or gravitational waves. But with the theme being we and the world, I'm going to be talking to you about something equally important, but perhaps more down to earth. So the class is, get rich by giving away freely. That may have left you slightly puzzled. And as a teacher, that's partly my intention, to keep you curious and engaged. Getting rich is normally associated with accumulation of wealth. Money, 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 getting rich. Mula, mana, call it what you will. Giving away freely, on the other hand, is the other end of the spectrum. It is about donating, sharing, charity, caring, etc. So how is it that the two of them can coexist? Is there a contradiction here? All these are fair questions. But I hope that with my presentation, I can convince you that there is one activity in which both of them coexist perfectly. And that activity is in volunteering. Let me explain. There are two aspects to volunteering. The giving away freely part is the one we are most familiar with. A volunteer, by definition, provides a service or shares a skill, and more importantly, provides that service without pay, without expecting anything in return. This part about doing it without pay, without expecting things in return, is often emphasized. But in my opinion, volunteering gives you riches that are beyond measure, a sense of joy and accomplishment that few paid jobs can provide. All of you here at Pearson, you volunteer as part of your CAS activity, so you very well understand what I'm talking about. Some of our deepest human connections, our richest life experiences, come from our times as a volunteer. If you really, if volunteering is about donating freely, then the more you give, the richer you get. If you really want to enrich your life, and if you want to leave a legacy that lasts forever, think outside a paid job. Think outside a salary scale. Think outside your bank balance. Think caring. Think sharing. Think giving away freely. Think volunteering. These are big claims, so let me justify them from my own experiences. I continue to volunteer in various activities, but for the sake of today's discussion, I'm going to draw examples from a three year stint as a volunteer in Zambia. I went to Zambia as a BSO volunteer to work in a small training institute there. I had just finished a graduate degree in robotics, the field of study which includes artificial intelligence and autonomous technologies in order to assist humans in various activities. I give you this background because this piece of information, as you will see, is quite crucial to the story. I went to work as an instructor at the Lukuru Training Center. This vocational school aimed to provide the students with a trade, a life skill, to help the disadvantaged youth in this remote, impoverished region. 
The institute wanted me to teach my students auto mechanics, how to repair cars. But in this remote village, we perhaps saw one or at the most two cars in a whole month. So auto mechanics seemed quite out of place. So we redesigned the program and called it Rural Mechanics. So I taught my students how to fix bikes, cycles, plowshares, diesel engines, pumps, whatever you could find in this very rural setting. I hope in a future presentation, I'll have an opportunity to share with you all my experiences from these three years in the cool. But for today's discussion about how volunteering enriches you, I'm going to draw upon just one story, and that is the story of Susan. I met Susan when she was recovering from a major surgery in the small rural health center in the Kool. But let me first provide you some background. Susan was born hemiplegic, which means that half her body was paralyzed. She had no use of her left arm or leg. In addition, even from childhood, she suffered from epileptic fits, these uncontrolled muscular spasms in which she would fall unconscious. But despite these major physical challenges, thanks to the care and support of her extended family, Susan grew up to be an independent adult with her own home and even her own family. That girl in the red shirt is Susan's daughter. One evening as Susan sat by the cooking fire, there is a cooking fire which is firewood. There is no power in this remote village. She was attacked by one of these epileptic fits, fell down unconscious with her right arm, her good arm, in the cooking fire. She was in a near coma and didn't know that she her right arm was getting badly burned. It took a few minutes before relatives close by realized what was going on and rushed to her rescue. The closest medical help was over 100 kilometers away in Lukun. So the relatives put Susan in an ox cart and walked for over two days to get to Lukun. By the time they reached medical help in Lukun, the infections in her affected arm were so severe that the attending physician decided to amputate her arm just below the elbow. The physician, Dr. Menali from the Netherlands, knew I had a robotics background and so asked if I could fashion a prosthesis to help Susan. So, in discussions with my Japanese volunteer colleagues, we tried to come up with a design that would help Susan. I asked Susan what it was that she missed the most, and she replied that when she had the, when she had the arm, she was at least able to feed herself. But now, having lost her hand, she was like a child, just waiting for someone to put food in her mouth. This naturally led to a loss of dignity and independence. So, after much discussion, we came up with a design. Remember, in this remote place, there is no Home Depot or Canadian Tire where we could go and buy the materials required or the tools needed. So, we used strips of aluminium hinged at the elbow with rivets. We fixed her arm to the stump of her upper arm using straps that the tailoring students designed. For the hand, the gripper, we used two blocks of wood that the faculty students made, held together by rubber bands. But wait, how does Susan open the gripper? This was the question that took us the biggest time to solve. After repeated attempts, the idea that finally worked was, we put a hook in the upper block and tied a steel wire to it. Susan still had full use of her head, so she would bend down and hold the wire between her teeth and pull the upper block up 
so that the gripper would open. She would then move her arm to whatever object she needed to pick up, let go of the wire, and the gripper would snap shut. It took some practice, but Susan managed to pick up the spoon, a slightly adapted spoon. And this picture here shows Susan having her first meal with a prosthesis. We also fashioned a cup so that she could drink water. This was, we had a, a, a sense of elation at this accomplishment. But wait, this is not a story about the prosthesis at all. This is not a story about any sense or any skill in robotics that I may have. The story is about Susan herself. This lady here, born with such physical challenges, but despite all that, with her, with her nerve and deep spirit, builds a life of independence for herself. But life comes around and de deals a really terrible blow, and she loses her arm in a terrible accident. What does Susan do? She picks up and rebuilds her life. And that is the picture I still have 18 years later. I still look at her, and all I see is the strength of will in her eyes. Here I am in fairly good health, with wonderful opportunities, surrounded by a close family, a community, and yet there are days when, when I get out with my head in my hands, mourning and self-pity about some small challenge that life poses in my path. Quite often at such times, I think of Susan, and her thought always picks me up. I tell myself, if Susan can do it, so can I. And that helps me stand up and walk on. If Susan can do it, so can I. And that's the message I'd like to leave you with today. I hope you will join me in saying it out loud. If Susan can do it, so can we all. So can we all. So can we all. We and the world in the face of any challenges, remember, if Susan can do it, so can we all. So can we all. Thank you so much.